My name is Sandra Stotts. Um, I am a, um, a lawyer um, working in Prince George and my um, primary focus um, in my legal practice is working with residential school survi survivors, taking them through the um, residential school um, independent assessment process. Yeah. I happen to be also a um, Mohawk from Six Nations. Uh, how about violence in the community? Remember those questions? I do remember those questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to focus on one community. I have the I have the um, fortunate um, privilege of being able to travel into many communities. I've been in communities as far north as Ross River, as um, and and as far south as Vancouver, I, I, I guess. People um, living on the streets in Vancouver, um, people living in the streets in Prince George, um, uh, people living in apartments all over the urban areas, and people living in the communities. Um, in my legal career, and I've done criminal law, family law, civil litigation, uh, and poverty law. Until I started doing the work that I do now, I never saw in my life so much violence and disparity amongst family members and community members and people that love each other. It makes you wonder. For the grace of God, go I. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> makes me feel um, very, very, very sad. It's sad that we live in such a country that there's so much wealth so when you um, go into um, Vancouver, when you go into a lot of the metropolitan areas of this area, on Ontario, Quebec, um, Montreal, Calgary, you see so much wealth, you see so much happiness, you see so many families and, you know, going out to dinner and doing things with each other. Um, and yet you get carried back to places where that kind of a coexistence does not always exist. You know, yes, people have lovely times with each other and they're very close with each other, but with the alcohol and the drugs and the addiction and just the, the disparity of the hopelessness, it, some, it can just dis disappear very quickly. Whenever you, whenever a, whenever another entity comes in and decides to control a population that has so much significance and value and love and meaning and and rule and their own rules and their own way of coexisting with each other and others and they say we're going to replace this with our ways that's what brought that on that's exactly what brought that on i think you you covered many things already in section three how um can you talk a little bit more in this area has the residential school experience had a multi-generational effect? It's had a multi-generational effect. Multi, I'll rephrase that, multi-generational effect, not only on um, the Aboriginal people, but on the non-Aboriginal people too. And the Aboriginal people, um, it, when one, I think one of the most significant 
I've said this so many times, the most significant part of a culture is the language. You know, a language, um, words and meaning really speaks to the heart and soul of the people. They have ways of experiencing things, communicating things that goes to their very core of existence when that's taken away and when people are punished and shamed into not being able to express themselves in the way that they should and in the beauty of it all um, that um, it, it takes away the pride and it takes away who, who they are and um, and then the violence that came with it this the um, from the and from the smallest physical assault to the gravest sexual assault and all in between that came into it. Um, all of that gets passed down because people don't know how to behave. They've lost their dignity. They've lost who they are. <clears throat> and so it gets passed down to their children because they can't no longer express. They can't say, you know, this... Um, is what you should be proud to be, who you should be proud to be. Instead, they, they're afraid they'll get hurt, and they, they don't pass that on. And then the children see that, they don't understand it, and, and, and the acting, the, the violence, and the drugs, and, and the alcohol that people use to medicate themselves because it's so painful, and there's nobody there for them. You were just making a connection between, um, there was just a connection there. Would you say in the, with the people you've been working with that the families are communicating about residential school, or communicating with each other, and oh, aware yeah. of all of that, those yeah. effects? Oh yeah, people are aware of it, but um, you know, there's so little help out there. There's so much need and so little help. Um, and still, that that the, um, I mean, it, there, you know, don't get me wrong. There is improvement. There really, I, um, it, there's so many young people that are that are um, um, <clears throat> understanding the the beauty of sobriety and understanding the the strength of who they are and in their culture and striving to learn, you know, more about who they are. There's so much. And even in the elders, um, there, there's, there's, many, there's many strengths and there's so many coming forward. <clears throat> but there's still many broken people and I think one of, the th one of the main reasons people are still broken is the residential school syndrome still exists in our society. Because now what happened, and what has happened, and when people left residential school, they were broken. And when they would come out into uh, mainstream society, um, people saw broken people. And rather than say, how can we help you? How can we build you up? How can we restore you? They put them down. You know, you walk into a bank, does the teller look you in the eye? Does the, um, do you get the same service when you go into a restaurant? This is 2011. How about your experiences at the hospital recently? You talked to me about that. Just recently I had to, um, I, I was sick and I had to go into emergency. And, um, and the emergency room was really crowded. 80% of the people um, in that emergency room were First Nations people. Um, I, I couldn't sit there very long. I had to leave. It was just breaking my heart. And I think what broke my heart worse, more than anything, is I would notice when people would speak to the nurses or the uh, people assisting. Uh, there was one way people spoke to people who were Aboriginal, and another way they spoke to people who were non-Aboriginal. And it was so, so difficult to watch that. And here I've been doing this work for, I don't know, eight, eight steady years doing nothing else. 
and um, and still and, and I would think by now I would be hardened and used to it but I, I can't get used to it. What was the difference? The difference was um, raising of the voice, speaking a little louder, you know, um, can I, on more than one occasion, can you understand me? You know, yeah, of course they can understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it just, it, it, I want to go and sit in front of, of the nurse and say, can you understand me? <laughs> you know, did you hear what I said? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, you know, and after a while you just say, I've got to leave. I don't think I'm that sick anymore. <laughs> you know, I think I feel so much better <laughs> because I'm not sick. I can't, I'm going to be sicker if I stay here. Oh, I'm, oh, I'll get in trouble if I stay here because I'm going to say something. <laughs> and uh, the, the experience is it's so sad. And, and then, you know, it, that should be a place where people get comfort, people get help. People are taken care of, and yet, and they are in pain, and they are needing help, but they're not treated in the same way as others, and they're dismissed. They're dismissed. You know, um, the first thing people look at is, or th that I find often, not always, not always, but the medical profession often looks at, are you drug addicted? Are you an alcoholic? Yeah. So that's what you were talking with me about yesterday, that you wanted to make that connection between what you said was racism and poverty and then the violence in our community. Yes. Yeah. And so it's a long, big circle, a huge circle. And then people feel this. They don't know what to do. It's, um, you know, it's the way it is. Um, and it's so hard to rise above it. And then on the other hand, should, is there an anger within all of us when, when you see the end result? Who do you get angry at? Do you, do you get angry at the person that is living on the streets? Or do you get angry at the society that keeps them on the streets? Well, what do you think could be done to break the cycle of multi I think I, I'm, <clears throat> there has to be a change within the person. Uh, each person has to take responsibility for, for people have to search their mind and they have to realize, am I being judgmental? Do I have a right to be judgmental? So how can I help that person? Rather than, than how can that person help themselves? That's one area. That's one way to look at it. The other area, way to look at it is, is, and the people affected have to realize it's not them. It is not them. They did not cause this. And they need to rise above it. That's hard. So you've seen that happen. How does it happen? I think it's, oh, I don't know if I, I want to give numbers, I don't know if I want to give percentages. Once in a while, I, I've, I've worked with a lot of survivors, um, many, um, oh, once in a while when a person is believed finally, it, it has such a healing effect. And they, with some people, um, not all, because the hurt is so deep, and the pain, and it takes more than just one person, but it's once in a while, people can say, finally I've been hurt. Finally somebody cares. Finally I realized it's not me. And, and healing starts beginning. Would you mind just taking a minute and just think through
from the Restricted Center, if there's anything you want to add? I think to put numbers on, on um, people isn't the way to do it. And, and, um, and that, that is exactly what the residential school experience was, a number. Took away the person and made them into a number. Numbers have no feeling. Numbers have no purpose. They're just there. <laughs>